Welcome to the Chapter 13 Taxation Tutorial. Moving on to the next slide, Chapter 13 is going to focus on a corporation's investment income and also look at what we call refundable taxes. Now when it comes to a corporation's investment income, the first thing that we want to talk about is this concept of integration. What integration basically says is that if an individual, let's say, earns the income individually through their social proprietorship, they should end up paying the same amount of tax if they were to incorporate the business and then pay a dividend out of the corporation to themselves, the shareholders. So once again, this concept of integration says that if we operate the business as a sole proprietorship, or if we decide to incorporate, pay corporate tax, and then distribute the after-tax funds to ourselves as the individual shareholder, we should get the same after-tax amount. Now, before we get into the details of Chapter 13, let's just quickly review how dividends are taxed for an individual shareholder. So if you're an individual shareholder and you receive a dividend from a corporation, you have to gross up the dividend. And in addition to that, you get a dividend tax credit. Now, there's two types of dividends. Eligible dividends need to be grossed up by 38% and the federal tax credit is 6 over 11 of the gross up. Now remember, there still is a provincial dividend tax credit as well, but the provincial fraction varies from province to province. For non-eligible, the gross up is 15%, and the federal tax credit is 9 over 13 of the gross up. Now, these figures that you see on this slide are as of 2019. So depending on when you're watching this video tutorial, these amounts may have changed since 2019. Moving on to the next slide, let's talk about the concept of refundable taxes. Now, refundable taxes is a way of basically removing any deferral opportunity from having a corporation earn that income. Let's talk about what we mean by deferral opportunity. Usually, a corporation may pay less tax on the same amount of income than if the income was earned directly by the individual. And so, if the company earns the income and does not pay a dividend yet to the shareholder, there's this deferral opportunity. So let's look at this example. Sam earns $100,000 of business income, and let's say Sam's combined tax rate, federal and provincial, is 45%. So they're going to pay 45,000 tax, and Sam will have 55,000 after tax. Now, if Sam was to incorporate, have the CCPC earn that same 100,000 of business income. Now let's assume that that's active business income subject to the small business deduction. His CCPC, his corporation, may pay combined federal provincial tax of 11%. And so therefore, the CCPC is going to have $89,000 left over to pay a dividend to Sam. Now, if the CCPC decides not to pay a dividend to Sam in that same year, there's this huge deferral of taxation. That's what we mean by a deferral opportunity. Until the CCPC pays a dividend to Sam, Sam will not be subject to any personal tax. So there's a huge deferral opportunity by using the CCPC. And hence, once again, the concept of refundable taxes. Now moving on to the next slide, the government is only concerned on deferral opportunities for the most part on passive type income, income that does not generate jobs. So if a CCPC earns active business income that is generating lots of jobs, generating salaries to their employees, increasing the economic impact, then the government is not so concerned about a deferral opportunity. But the government is concerned when there's deferral on aggregate investment income, hence refundable tax on aggregate investment income. Now, Let's talk about what is aggregate investment income. It's a defined definition, which is defined on your rates table, but basically it includes these amounts. The net taxable capital gains for the year, reduced by any net capital loss carryovers, includes other passive income, such as interest, rents, royalty, and generally includes all foreign dividends. Now you notice that the one thing it does not include is Canadian source dividends. And the reason for that is, as we learned in chapter 12, a corporation that receives Canadian source dividend is not going to be taxed on that because it had read, has already been taxed once on the corporate level. Now we also get to, um, once again, it does not include dividends that are deductible and computing taxable income. So that's sort of the only caveat when it comes to aggregate investment income is it includes most passive sources of income. 
except for dividends that are deducted when we calculate our taxable income. So moving on to the next slide, how will we tax this aggregate investment income? So we talked about the fact that in part one tax, there's this ART, this additional refundable tax. And we learned that in chapter 12. The ART again is 10 and two thirds percent times the lesser of three amounts. The corporation's aggregate investment income, the amount by which the taxable income exceeds the amount for the small business deduction, and those are the lesser, sort of lesser of two amounts. Those are the two amounts that the ART is calculated on. So in order to keep the tax high on aggregate investment income, a CCPC will pay 38%, which is basically the federal and provincial tax rate that we've seen in, pre, in chapter 12, plus this additional 10 and two thirds. And so the CCPC then will pay 48 and two thirds percent on aggregate investment income. So it takes away that deferral opportunity. There's no more advantage now of having a CCPC earn the aggregate investment income versus the individual uh, person. Now, part of this ART will be refundable. So part of the ART, part of the part one tax that's assessed on the AII will be refunded. And the amount that's refunded will be paid back to the corporation when they pay a dividend to their shareholders. So let's actually look at this refundable portion of part one tax on the next slide. The refundable portion of part one tax is calculated as the lesser of three amounts. The first amount being 30 and two thirds percent, essentially times the company's aggregate investment income. And there's also this adjustment for foreign non-business tax credits. The second amount, 30 and two thirds percent of the corporation's taxable income, minus the amount that was eligible for the small business deduction, and also an adjustment for foreign tax credits as well. And the third amount is the part one tax payable. Now this part one tax payable includes the ART. Remember the ART, the additional refundable tax? That is part of part one tax. Now the rates table gives you the complete calculation. So refer to that when you're doing these calculations for a refundable portion of part one tax. Moving on to the next slide, let's look at this example. Let's say Sally transferred her investments to a wholly owned corporation, ABC, and ABC is a CCPC. Now let's say Sally's combined tax rate is 45%. Now ABC is gonna earn the $100,000 of aggregate investment income, and we're gonna assume that that equals ABC's net income and also taxable income. And let's assume that ABC has a combined tax rate of 38%. Now, let's actually see what happens if Sally was to earn that 100,000 AII directly. She would have to pay 45,000 tax and would have 55,000 after tax. Now, if ABC was to earn that 100,000, the aggregate investment income does not qualify for the small business deduction. It does not qualify for the manufacturing and processing profits deduction or the general rate reduction. So essentially, ABC would have to pay 38% on that $100,000 of aggregate investment income, therefore 38,000 of tax. Now, because 38% is less than the 45% that Sally would have to pay individually, there is still a deferral opportunity. Therefore, we have the addition of the ART. So let's move on to the next slide and continue on with this example. ABC is going to earn the 100,000 AII directly. So far, they're going to pay 38% or 38,000 in part one tax. Now we have to add the ART. We're going to add this refundable tax to remove the deferral opportunity. And we're going to calculate that as 10 and two thirds percent times the AII. Now we learned that the ART is the lesser of two amounts, but let's assume that the lesser of the two amounts is the AII of 100,000. So ABC then is gonna pay a total of 48,667 in part one tax. That's gonna remove that deferral opportunity. The corporation actually pays more tax than if Sally, Sally was to earn the AII directly herself. However, 48 and two thirds percent is a huge amount of corporate tax to pay. So ABC will get some of that back 
when ABC decides to pay a dividend to Sally. And the amount they get back is known as a dividend refund. So now we're going to track how much will they get back. And so moving on to the next slide, let's actually track how much they're going to get back. The amount they get back is known as, a, as the refundable portion of the Part 1 tax. And that's the lesser of the three amounts. The first amount, 30 and two-thirds percent times the AII. The second amount is the amount 30 and two-thirds times the taxable income minus the small business deduction. Because ABC only earned aggregate investment income, there's no small business deduction. The item number two is also going to be 30,667. And the third item is the Part 1 tax payable, which we calculated earlier to be 48,667. So the lesser of the three amounts is 30,667. That's the maximum of the Part 1 tax that ABC will get back when they pay a dividend to Sally, the shareholder. Now, that amount is going to be added to what we call the RDTOH account, the refundable dividend tax on hand. Now, there are two RDTOH accounts starting in 2019, eligible and also non-eligible. Moving on to the next slide, let's continue on with this example. We calculated the refundable Part 1 tax to be 30667 Now, refundable Part 1 tax generally gets added to the non-eligible RDTOH, RDTOH account. So we're going to add that to the non-eligible RDTOH account. And once again, ABC will get that back if and when they pay enough dividends to their shareholders. So the amount they get back is known as the dividend refund. The dividend refund is calculated as the dividends paid times 38 and one third percent. Now the dividend refund, of course, cannot exceed the balance in the corresponding RDTOH account. So if ABC was to pay a dividend to their shareholders and designate it as a non-eligible dividend, depending on the amount of the dividend they pay, the maximum they can get back is 30,667. So let's figure out what is then going to be the minimum dividend. Let's rearrange this formula. We're going to basically rearrange this. We know that they want to get 30,667 back as the dividend refund. So we're going to rearrange the formula, divide that amount by 38 and one third percent. And so in order to get all of that amount back, ABC is going to have to pay a dividend of 80,000 to its shareholder. Therefore, if you think about it, once they pay the $80,000 dividend, they're going to get $30,667 back. And so the effective tax that ABC pays on that $100,000 of aggregate investment income is only going to be 18%. And so let's actually move on to the next slide and continue on with this example. ABC will now pay a dividend of $80,000, non-eligible to Sally. They're going to get a dividend refund, and now ABC's non-eligible RDTOH account will be nil because they got that full amount back. So they have to reduce that account balance to zero. Now let's actually see what happens to Sally. Sally is going to receive an $80,000 non-eligible dividend. Once again, dividends need to be grossed up because this is non-eligible. She's going to gross it up by 15%. And so the amount that she's going to include in 3A as part of her net income for tax purposes is going to be $92,000. Now, she's going to pay tax at 45%. Remember, we assume that her combined federal and provincial tax rate was 45%. She's going to pay $41,400 tax, but she will get a dividend tax credit. Now, remember, the dividend tax credit is a percentage or fraction of the gross up. The gross up was $12,000. The federal dividend tax credit on non-eligible dividends was 9 over 13. Let's assume for this example that the provincial dividend tax credit is 4 over 13 in the province that Sally lives. So her dividend tax credit is going to be $12,000. So the net amount of tax she's going to pay is 29400 So how much will Sally have then after tax? She actually receives an $80,000 dividend. She pays 29400 tax, so she's going to have 50600 left after tax. Now remember, in earlier on when we talked about the fact that salary could have earned this AII directly, she would have only paid 45% tax, and so she would have had 55000 after tax. So in this example, using these tax rates, Sally would have been better off 
earning that AII directly. There was no deferral opportunity because of the additional refundable tax. And in terms of the overall tax paid, the amount of tax paid by the corporation and herself would have been more than if she had earned the tax, or the AII directly herself. So that's an example of the additional refundable tax, the ART, and also the refundable Part 1 tax. Let's move on to the next slide. There's also another type of refundable tax. This is referred to as refundable Part 4 tax. Now, refundable Part 4 tax only applies to certain dividend income that is received by a private corporation. So whereas ART, the additional refundable tax, only applies to CCPCs, the refundable Part 4 tax applies to only dividend income received by a private corporation. Now remember that when a corporation receives Canadian source dividends, they include it in their net income for tax, but they get to deduct it when calculating taxable income. So there's never going to be any Part 1 tax on Canadian source dividends. So then let's talk about Part 4 tax. The refundable Part 4 tax basically will take away any deferral opportunity if a private corporation was to earn dividend income. Remember, they're not subject to Part 1 tax, so a deferral opportunity could exist if it wasn't for this Part 4 tax. Now, the company will pay Part 4 tax when they receive the dividend income. They'll track the Part 4 tax in the RDTOH account, just like we did with the refundable Part 1 tax. And then when they pay a dividend to their shareholders, <clears throat> they're going to get a dividend refund of some of that Part 4 tax that was paid. Once again, this is done to remove any deferral opportunity of having a private corporation earn dividend income. So let's move on to the next slide and let's talk about the exact calculation. There's two calculations that could apply, one of the two, when a private corporation receives dividends. The first one applies if the corporations are not connected. This essentially is if a corporation, let's say, was to invest in a big public company, such as shares in Bell Canada, Rogers Communication, TELUS, then they of course would not be connected with that corporation. Their ownership is probably so small that there's no owner, uh, there's no connection between the two corporations. That's essentially what we mean by if the corporations are not connected, that there's not a huge amount of ownership between the two corporations. These are referred to as portfolio investments. Now the Part 4 tax is fairly straightforward. We take 38 and 1 third percent and multiply it by the dividends that are received, the portfolio dividends that are received. The second instance is if the corporations are connected. There is sort of enough common ownership between let's say the parent and the sub that they're considered connected. We'll talk about the definition of connected right uh, in the next uh, bullet point. If the corporations are connected and the payer corporation, the subsidiary, receives a dividend refund, then Part 4 tax applies. If the payer corporation does not receive a dividend refund, then Part 4 tax will not apply. In this example, if we were to have application of Part 4 tax between connected corporations, we would take the percentage ownership that the parent has of the sub, multiply that by the dividend refund received by the payer corporation, the subsidiary, and that would be the amount of Part 4 tax that the recipient corporation has to pay. Now, what do we mean by connected corporations? Well, the owner, the shareholder corporation, has control of the subsidiary. That would be one way they're connected. Or the second way is if the shareholder corporation owns 10% of the voting or greater than 10% of the voting share, and also 10% of the fair market value of all shares, then the two corporations are connected. Moving on to the next slide, let's look at an example of Part 4 tax. Let's say ABC owns 1% of PubCo, so they're not connected, and 75% of Private Co, they are connected. ABC receives $10,000 of eligible dividends from PubCo. That represents their 1% ownership claim on the dividends that PubCo issues to the shareholders. So that's 10,000 of eligible dividends. And let's say they also receive 50,000 of non-eligible dividends from Private Co. That represents their 75% share of the total dividends that Private Co pays. And in doing so, Private Co receives a total dividend refund 
of 19167 So let's then figure out what's going to be the Part 4 tax. We know that the dividends have to be included in ABC's net income, but they get deducted when they calculate taxable income. So there's going to be no Part 1 tax on the 60000 dividend income. Moving on to the next slide, let's talk about the Part 4 tax. Now remember, there's two separate calculations depending on whether the corporations are connected. In the first part, they get dividends from PubCo. They're not connected with PubCo because they only own 1%. So the way we calculate that Part 4 tax is we take 38 and 1 3rd percent times the portfolio dividends received. ABC now has to pay 3833 in Part 4 tax. Now, with the other dividends from private co, because they are connected, we take the percentage ownership. ABC owns 75% of private co, and we multiply that by the dividend refund that private co received when they paid that dividend, 19167 So now ABC has to pay 14375 in Part 4 tax. Now, the total Part 4 tax, if we add those two amounts together, is 18208 And ABC now has to track those amounts in their RD2H account to make sure that they keep track of all these refundable taxes they pay. So when they pay a dividend to their shareholders, they're going to get all or some of these taxes back. Now, the portfolio dividends... The refundable tax paid on the portfolio dividends, the 38, uh, 3833, is going to be added to the eligible RDTOH account. Remember, those were eligible dividends, and so the refundable tax gets added to the eligible RDTOH account. Now, in terms of the dividends from the private corporation, they were non-eligible, so the refundable Part 4 tax, 14375 gets added to the non-eligible RD2H account for ABC. Once again, ABC will get these amounts back if and when they pay a dividend to their shareholders. Moving on to the next slide, these refundable taxes are tracked in the RD2H account. Now prior to 2019, there was only one RD2H account and it was fairly straightforward. Tracking the balance was fairly easy. We would add these, this would be the basically how they would be tracked. We take the opening balance, we subtract any dividend refund that was received for last year. Then we add the refundable taxes for this year. All the refundable Part 1 tax, all the refundable Part 4 tax gets all added into this one account. Fairly straightforward. Moving on to the next slide. In 2019, things changed. Now a private corporation has two RD2H accounts an eligible and non-eligible. When the private company pays a dividend, the dividend must be designated as either eligible or non-eligible. Now, eligible dividends are paid out of what we call the general rate income pool. Basically, the corporation paid the general rate of tax. And so the reason they're called eligible dividends is that because the corporation just paid the general rate of tax, the individual shareholder, when they receive that eligible dividend, will be eligible for a higher dividend tax credit. They're going to pay lower individual tax. Compare that to a non-eligible dividend. Non-eligible dividends are paid out of a company's LRIP, low rate income pool. The corporation paid low corporate tax. So when the individual shareholder receives a non-eligible dividend, they're not going to be eligible for a higher individual dividend tax credit, so therefore they're going to pay higher individual tax. That's sort of a summary of these two different types of dividends. Now, dividends designated as eligible will be able to have a dividend refund to the extent of the balance in their eligible RDTOH account. Same with non-eligible. If a non-eligible dividend is paid, then there could be a dividend refund to a maximum of the balance in the non-eligible RDTOH account balance. So that's why it's important for private companies to carefully keep track of both their eligible RDTOH account and their non-eligible RDTOH account. On the next slide, when they do pay a dividend, they're going to get a dividend refund. Now remember, the dividend refund is the lesser of two amounts. The first amount 
is 38 and one third percent of the dividends that were paid. The second amount is the balance in that specific RDTOH account. So that's the calculation of the dividend refund. Now, if a private company has no balance in either the eligible or non-eligible RDTOH account, that means they didn't pay any refundable taxes that haven't yet been returned. So keep that in mind. If there's no balance in either the RDTOH accounts, then that means they have not paid any refundable taxes that they're waiting to get back from the government. So that brings us to the end of the Chapter 13 tutorial. Now the Chapter 13 tutorial is quite comprehensive. There's a lot of new material. So make sure that you do as many examples that you can on your own. Review what we do in class, review the notes that are provided in class, do the exercises and the self-study problems in the textbook for extra practice. Now that brings us to the end of the Chapter 13 tutorial focusing on refundable taxes. Good luck with your studies and we'll see you in the next video.